Yes, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Bruce Feingold, who's here to give us a presentation today. Uh, Dr. Feingold has had 35 years as a practicing clinical psychologist. I believe it's in the Walnut Creek area. Yes. Um, he has been, he's worked in community mental health programs with children, adolescents, and families. He's worked as a clinical consultant on an adult unit of a psychiatric hospital. And he's founded and directed training programs for masters and doctoral interns. Um, he has specialized in the treatment of men his whole career, including leading two men's group for past 25 years. So we're honored to have Bruce here today. Well, thanks for being here, and I'm honored to um, come and present. Um, as the introduction said, 15 years of my career, I worked in community mental health with low-income, working-class, white, African-American, Hispanic families, children and adolescents. Uh, my first job was probably my favorite. We worked in-home intensively to prevent hospitalization of teenagers or placement. So there were many, many suicidal adolescents. And all the while, I built a private practice, and then I worked for five years in Walnut Creek Hospital, which is a large inpatient psychiatric unit that no longer exists. And I worked with many very severely depressed adults with a high prevalence of suicidality. Uh, on a personal note, I don't think it's a coincidence that about 80, 90% of my practice is with men. Um, when I was young, I loved sports, played basketball, and in my dreams, if I was a foot taller, I'd be talking now as a retired player to um, general managers of sports about the toxic effects of masculinity on athletes. But I also was a, a poetic, kind of aesthetic person. I was an English lit major in college. And I knew from a very early age that I didn't fit into the traditional stereotypes of masculinity. And I knew in my heart that the, the, the rigidity and the obsolescence of what we define as traditional masculinity. So let's start with a clinical vignette. Let's see here. Let's see how that. Okay. Let's start with a typical depressed man. These men tend to be more angry and stressed. We're always asking with these guys, is it just anger or character problems versus there is a depressive component? Let me give you, and, and the role of substance abuse as well. Let me give you an example of a man named Donald. He came in because his wife demanded it, so he was externally motivated. He was angry, explosive, and very disillusioned. He had two very disabled children, and he thought their disabilities were an affront to his masculinity. He showed care by doing. He was a good provider. He was incredibly work-focused, and he numbed out a lot with computer games and the internet. So there wasn't any internal motivation, and he dealt with his problems by externalizing and blaming. You see the cartoon at the end, the pillow says, I don't know how much more I can take. It's your fault, Paul. So there's the angry depression and then the blaming that goes on with this kind of patient. Let me fast forward to a pivotal session about a year later when actually he was doing a little bit better and the couples and the parenting part was a little better, but he lost his job. And he felt incredibly humiliated and he fell apart. He started drinking. He threatened to kill himself. Without his wife knowing it, he made plans to leave home, and he actually did. And I asked him during the couple session whether he was depressed, and I was facing him here, and his wife was over here on the couch. And she wildly shaking her head, flapping, of course he's depressed. And he said, I'm not depressed. I'm too busy to be depressed. I've got too much on my plate to wallow or spin in my head. So even in a period of breakdown for these men, they externalize rather than internalize their distress. And this is what one of the ideas of this, we'll talk a lot about the typical depressed man. Let me give you a second type of man, another type of presentation. These are the selfless men, the Thoreau's men of quiet desperation. These men don't suffer loudly they suffer quietly. I had seen uh, this guy 
for quite a while, off and on. His wife had very serious chronic depression and hospitalizations. And he came in again because his wife, had, after a year of relative health, had another breakdown. He told me he was withdrawn from friends, wasn't concentrating at work. He was even drinking. This was a very kind of straight, kind of moderate kind of guy. He wasn't doing his biking that he liked to do, wasn't taking care of himself. His sleep was off. Uh, this kind of guy tends to be sort of moderate. They're not highly traditional like Donald, like these angry, depressed guys were very traditional kinds of men. And I asked him if he's depressed, and he said, no. These men have learned to soldier on. They're resigned. They're not angry. But they don't endorse much vulnerability. And like Don, the angry, depressed guy, they don't often seek treatment on their own. These men refuse to give in to their emotional pain, and they, really, they cope, and they cope well, and they'd say they don't need help. And you can see here in the cartoon, everything's going on, and are you okay? And he says, no. Oh, he says, yes, I'm fine, I'm just tired. So again, these men don't internalize the depression. Oh, the other way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we call the, and I'll talk a lot about what we think about as atypical male depression subtype. Okay. So what are we going to do here today? We're going to talk about why are women diagnosed with depression more than men? Why do men kill themselves more at a higher rate than women, even though women are diagnosed more with depression? Do men experience and perceive and conceptualize depression differently? Is this idea of the angry male subtype depression empirically validated? We'll look at the effect of gender roles and what's called hegemonic masculinity on depression, suicide, assessment, and treatment. Let me say a little bit about this term hegemonic. That's the new term that gender studies is usually to describe uh, masculinity, the dominant masculine in our society. Um, I've given you an article on the back page uh, summarizing the theories and issues of masculinity in the last 40 years. And what many writers are talking about is, there, well, in our society we project a dominant idea of masculinity, or femininity for that man, matter. But what we know, truly there are many masculinities, there are many forms of femininities, but we're talking about a, a, an archetypal projection. If you ask people, you know, what's a traditional man? What's the role of a woman? And of course, gender roles are changing so much in our society. Um, and then we'll look at an integrative approach of working with men. And then finally, we'll talk about some seminal new contributions on the study of suicide and treatment by Maltzberger and Joyner. Let's do a quick overview of the psychological and social cultural issues of depression. Depression is the most common form of disability and mental health issue in the United States and the world. So it's incredibly important we're all experts in the treatment and assessment of depression. In any year, up to 10% of Americans have major depressive disorder, and that doesn't include dysthymic disorders. Depression is way more prevalent in women than men, and yet, uh, men complete suicide at a much higher rate than women do. And of course, women attempt suicide way more. Let me talk about some general risk factors for suicide attempts and completed suicide. Vets, Native Americans, especially Inuits up in Alaska, LGBT community, divorce, widowed and single men, substance abuse, especially alcohol, bipolar depression, white men, lower economic status, and access to guns. It's interesting, the, the rate of depression and suicide is higher in white men than other ethnic groups, and that's consistently coming out in the data. Also, from the ages of 10 to 64, suicide is the leading cause of death for both men and women, which is really a startling statistic. Social culturally, poverty, lower income level is highly related to depression and suicide. 
But it's interesting in terms of gender roles. For women, depression's related to work overload, stress, economic dependence, social strat status issues that we know goes on in terms of male-female relationships in our culture and others. But for men, depression and suicide is much more related to the loss of the traditional role of masculinity, the loss of status, and the new or in the last five years, the loss of privilege of white male patriarchy. Um, and I think what we're seeing in our country, go on, on about this, but I won't, we're seeing this shift in gender roles and very much played out in the election between traditional ideas of masculinity and femininity and non-traditional ideas. Okay, let's talk about the understanding of male depression through the lens of gender studies or masculinity. In the last 30 or 40 years, a major shift happened. We started to define masculinity or femininity not as a biological given, but as Ron Levant says, a socially constructed set of gender norms. Additionally, the men, a clinician started to look at the experience of depression by men. And they started to realize that men, in their opinions, were underdiagnosed in the rate of depression compared to women. And they said something that's rather startling. They said the DSM diagnosis is gender biased, that it addresses the way that women experience depression, but not men. So, let me talk a little general theory about being a multicultural therapist. In the last 20, 30 years, we've become much more aware of our differences, of what we bring, our gender, our ethnic group, how we identify as gay or not gay, all those sorts of things, our class, in terms of psychotherapy. So we, there's a big push, and I think a correct one, to be multiculturally competent. And in the, male, in the, in the field of uh, working with men, there's the same kind of thought, that we need to be more sensitive to the multicultural aspect of working with men, which sort of turns it on his ear, because it really, the, the masculine studies really started because of the rise of feminism. And a specific way to conceptualize uh, the issue of traditional masculinity is what's called gender role strain or gender role conflict. And this goes back to Joseph Pleck in the 70s and 80s. And it's a very simple way to think about it, and that is the conflict between who you are as a man, what you want to be, and what you think society says you should be, or the actual, not just your perception, but the actual pressures that men get in terms of behaving and feeling in a certain way about what it means to be a man. And that this strain, this conflict, is limiting to men. So I ask you, when you're doing your work, is first of all, what's your own view of masculinity? What did you see with your father, your father figures? What did you see in your rela the relationship between your parents in terms of masculine feminine roles? And how do you think this affects to, to be sensitive? I want to raise your consciousness to be aware of how this idea of how you see gender roles, how your patient affects psychotherapy, or does it affect it? And that's one of the questions, of course, we'll address today. In the late, in the early 70s, we, clinicians and also writers like Robert Bly and all those good folks started defining what it means to be a man. And I, David and Brandon's book is rather wonderful, and they have four features. The first one is no sissy stuff. So masculinity was defined as not feminine, not gay. You have to restrict your feelings and this fear of the feminine be Jungian about, it, or the fear of women, or the fear of gayness. So no sissy stuff. And an important aspect of this, which we'll talk a lot about, is emotional control. The prohibitions about expression of feeling and that men need to control their feelings as a very common sort of issue, as I'm sure you're aware of. The second one, the big wheel. Success, work, be a big shot. 
The third one is a sturdy oak. You have to be strong and independent. And this, again, is a very important theme we're going to talk about, over self-reliance. Men have to do it on their own. Very important for mental health, for men. And finally, the aggressive aspect of masculinity, give them hell. Adventure, risk, aggression, violence. So when you look at these ideas, researchers started to say, well, let's, let's do some study on this versus just clinicians' views and what's going on in the culture. And they started doing scales. That's what psychologists do in research. They make scales. And this is one of the really uh, well-known scales done in 2003. It's used a lot for research. And I want you to notice it has, again, the idea of over-self-reliance, the idea of over-emotional control, two of those very important features, and then it's got the things we'd expect. To def these are scales that define the um, different sub-aspects of being traditional male. Winning, violence, uh, playboyism is sort of the, um, you know, the, the uh, Flirting with women, affairs, that kind of thing, being a, a playboy. Uh, the primacy of work, and again, we see the disdain for homosexuality, for being gay. And these, when we, so when we talk about traditional male, these are the different features. Does that make sense? These are the subscales. And you realize that what's really interesting is that how much sexism, fear of gayness is part of this, um, this traditional masculinity. Yeah, go ahead. I think this is very Western and predominant in Western. I don't know if they've used these scales. I mean, you know, Europe tends to be very patriarchal. Um, some of this research, I don't know how much they've done cross-culturally for other cultures. What's interesting is across ethnicity, there is, uh, it seems like this masculinity as a traditional uh, stereotype uh, is more important than ethnic adherence. So there's a lot of re research on masculinity and how it's, it is done differently, people experience differently culture, but when the research, and I'll get to that right now, that when we look at the mental health and traditional masculinity research findings, that the ones I'm gonna talk about really do cut across most ethnic groups. There's been lots of small studies, a lot of meta studies, and they've come up with some we're basic sorts of things which you're probably familiar with. First of all, men don't go to treatment as much as women. How many of you see 50-50 men and women in your practice? Show of hands. How many of you see 80% women? 80% men? About. Okay. So most of you probably have more women in your practice than men. And that's been always the case. It's getting a little better because culture is changing. But men don't go to therapy as much. And they're not as comfortable in psychotherapy as much. We also know that traditional masculinity, and this is across different ethnic groups, correlate with many toxic aspects. Yeah. Sure. It's terrible, yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah, yeah, of sexual harassment, sexual predation, yeah. So traditional masculinity correlates with a fear of intimacy, lowered relationships, depression, anxiety, etc. What some further meta-studies started doing the last couple of years is looking at specific aspects of masculinity and looked at mental health and the issue of over-self-reliance Sexism and playboyism, sexual predation, harassment, as you will, correlated with negative mental health, especially negative interpersonal relationships, which makes sense. And they all started looking about what are healthy factors for men, healthy aspects of masculinity that were related to better mental health. And they found that men who could rely on others, men who were more emotionally expressive and had less of the sexism had positive mental health. That makes sense? So a little cartoon here is Moses is in the desert, and of course he doesn't want to ask for directions, the stereotype men, and, and Mrs. Moses, I think it says, secretly asked for directions after 39 and a half years. So I thought that was a pretty funny cartoon. 
A friend of mine sent me that during Passover. So, around the year 2000, clinicians started to talk about uh, depression more. And they started to uh, hypothesize that women were underdiagnosed compared to women. Uh, men were underdiagnosed because men experience, as I said earlier, depression differently than women. And they started an hypothesis to talk about a male depression subtype, a typical male depression, and as I say, men get mad and not sad and maybe drunk. Externalizing behaviors. They also deal with stress by distraction, avoidance, people talk sex addiction, pornography, all the ways that men avoid or numb out as well as escape into work. So this was the beginning hypothesis of what male depression looks like. So what do researchers do next? Of course, they make a scale of the masculine depression scale. It's a very well uh, used uh, scale. And if you notice, there's some very, there's overlap with traditional diagnosis of depression, blunted affect, loss of interest, et cetera, change in sexual desire. But we also have some of those themes we've talked about. Um, over need for autonomy and self-reliance, inability to express feelings, anger and aggression, external blaming, being self-critical, and burdensomeness. And I'll talk a lot about burdensomeness when we talk about suicide. Yeah. On these scales, is it there a significance between number one and number 16, or are they just all? No, they're all okay. just... Okay. Se considered separate factors to try to assess male depression. Sure. I, you know, I'm trying to raise your consciousness here. I, you know, I, I don't know how many, I don't use, there are psychologists and therapists who use like the Beck inventory for suicide or they use an ADD scale. For me, in the way I work, I, as I do my interview, I'm looking and assessing these different aspects of male depression and how it fits the profile the individual is bringing in. So I think of them as part of my clinical interview. I, you know, I, I very much against that roteness that goes on. I don't think we're mechanics. I think we're artists more than mechanics. So um, I think using these ideas and listening sensitively, being a multiculturally tuned in therapist with men in terms of assessing depression will improve their sense you're, they're, he they're being heard and their sense you know what's going on with their experience. But again, there are people that use these. A lot of the, you know, the research type psychologists and therapists who work in universities, they'll often give scales like this as part of their clinical assessment. And remember, in the 50s and 60s, that was way more common. People would do, in the beginning of psychotherapy, they would give a couple of itemized tests or the MMPI. But, uh, you know, if people still work that way. I don't. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I also, in the bibliography, I think this article's referenced, and I think you can get the whole article online, too. So this generated lots of clinical studies, small sample studies, about this idea of male depression subtype and whether it's empirically validated. And what I want to do is talk about one wonderful study, a seminal piece of work by Lisa Martin. She did this in 2013 as part of her dissertation at the University of Michigan. And then she's written quite a few articles about it. And what she did is she looked at a study in the early 2000s, a national study of over 10,000 subjects. And she went back and reanalyzed the study. So it's really interesting. It's a great study because it's a big sample size. You know, a lot of these studies, someone gets a grant and they do 100 subjects, but this is a meta-study of 10,000 subjects. And she found out 
stuff that really validates the, the new kind of thinking about depression in men and women. They did find there's an overlap between men and women between traditional DSM diagnosis. There are men who look depressed in the same way that women look depressed, right? Does that fit your experience where you see men that look depressed and they verbalizing it very similar, similar kind of symptom pictures as women? However, she did find something that was validated this, I, this idea of male depression. She found a significant number of men exhibited externalizing symptoms, anger, aggression, risk-taking, and substance abuse. Those are the big four that came out for these male depression type guys. Men were less likely to report withdrawal, sleep issues, and complainiveness. Complainiveness is a research, I, I think it's a terrible term. You know, men of course aren't supposed to complain and women complain too much, but it's a, it's a technical term. It's talking about expressing your distress. So I, I always say the caveat is, like you said about playboyism, this term complainiveness kind of turns me off, but it's a research term. Um, and so her main point is that externalizing behaviors and withdrawal are a signal for men to get help. And for women, they were more likely to present with depressed mood, sleep problems, and discomplaintiveness. And that internalizing symptoms in depression are a signal for women to get help. So very different presentations uh, across certain cohorts of men and women in terms of how they experience depression. Interestingly, she did find there's a group of women who presented as angry, depressed as well. Uh, when I was presenting this to a colleague over dinner one night, he said, well, maybe these are just explosive disorder, characterological problem guys, you know, sociopathic, conduct, narcissistic. But what's interesting is she did find there was a very weak correlation between depression, the male depression, anger type, with intermittent explosive disorder. So she really suggests it's a different way of diagnosing men. And she said, once you did that, there was actual equal rates of depression in this big mega study. That if you included these aggressive, angry, depressed guys with the traditional depressed guys, the rates were similar, which is really interesting. She also found there was an overlap between externalizing symptoms of depression with major depression, with traditional major depression. Let me give you a, a, a little bit off topic, or not off topic. But there, there's a famous Amish study that she quotes. In the Amish community, depression is pretty split equally between men and women. So the hypothesis is they don't have the role conflict issues. It's very homogeneous and set, and they don't have alcoholism. Tend not to. So it's very interesting uh, that, that, again, when you look at different subcultures, you sometimes have uh, where, again, this, this Amish study has shown that men and women have equal rates of depression. It's really interesting. So again, the idea that Depression is, is gender role oriented versus some biological given. Now, of course, there's postpartum, there are other issues, but we're talking about generalizations here. Okay. No, I don't think so. I think it's similar to, the, I think, yeah. Is it lower? Maybe it is lower. Yeah, I might be wrong about that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, was there any studies around the overlap um, with the externalizing behaviors and anxiety related to anger as well? Well, you know, anxiety and depression are highly related. So a lot of people, men and women, they get really anxious and they explode, right? They're really anxious, they're worried, and they move into explosion and anger. She didn't directly address that. Okay, so the idea perhaps is that the depression is underlying and then that feeds the anxiety yeah. that which she's anxious. Yeah, she didn't find, at least in the studies that I read, that it was, the, the depression was totally fueled by the anxiety. But of course, as you know, there's a tremendous overlap in anxiety disorders and depression. Next, let's, let's look at um, risk factors. Again, lots of studies on this. I'm going to quote uh, a an article by Dr. Meyer, Meyer uh, Weissman, and she summarizes a huge longitudinal study from Virginia of twins. And what she found, and what the study finds, is that in terms of history, that men have more child sexual abuse, conduct disorder, drug abuse, history of major depression, and financial and work and legal stress. How many of you see teenagers have seen teenagers in your career? 
Think about those conduct disorder boys you see. They may be oppositional, they may have attention stuff, learning stuff. They may have a lot of family issues as well. And you're always trying to figure out, is this purely oppositional conduct or is there an anxiety or depression aspect? I see teenagers long term. I see a handful of kids from 12, 13, 14 through college, and even after college. And what I found was some of these kids who were labeled narcissistic, uh, terribly conduct disordered, failing in school, et cetera, all those externalizing behaviors, as they slow down and they stop acting out, they have underlying depression and anxiety disorders that have never been seen because they're externalizing so much. So it's really interesting that in terms of risk factors, conduct disorder is a risk factor in the twin studies and across the board for uh, depression. So it kind of confirms this idea of the angry depression hypothesis. Uh, for women, there's neuroticism and all the interpersonal problems, low marital satisfaction, divorce, absent maternal warmth. A neuroticism comes from the big uh, factor theory. Again, I think it's sort of a sexist term. It's a research term, but it's describing similar complaintiveness, expression, anxiety, worry, verbalization. But um, as, as you can see, as, as Weissman says, it's rather startling that it fits the sexist stereotypes that for men, the triggers for depression are failure to achieve and lowered self-worth, and for women, interpersonal problems. And that's kind of our stereotype of what causes depression in men and women. And I guess there are, there are women who have upsets and depressions related to work, financial strain, et cetera. And of course, there are men who sometimes are responding to interpersonal issues. But again, we're talking about generalizations here. And not for women, in the twin study. It's hard, yeah, it's a little bit mind boggling, isn't it? We know in general that adverse events, you know this new term they're using in the literature, adverse events in childhood, and that includes divorce, sexual abuse, predation, all those sorts of things, are definitely across the board has really negative effects on adult functioning. But they, again, they're talking about trends in terms of predicting depression. I've been major depression. I've been working with trauma survivors, mostly women. I've yeah. worked with some male right. trauma survivors as well. Yeah. The, boy, the the depression is sure. Yeah. Very. But then you're talking uh, about a remarkable. whole level of people who are trying to more predict depression. So yeah, women who are sexually abused often have, you know, very difficult times. But it's not, at least in these twin studies, not a predictor. Not twin yeah. Shocking. That's a good point. So I want to talk about four types of men that I see in my practice. And the first two we've talked about, the atypically depressed guy, angry, externalizing, highly traditional, substances, self-reliant, express anger but not other vulnerable feelings. They don't seek help. A lot of character pathology, high achievement needs. Then there were the selfless men that we talked about, these flat withdrawn. These men are more mild to moderate. They don't tend to be highly traditional. Uh, oh, they, they suffer silently, they suffer silently, they tough it out, they're often providers, loyal. Uh, they're less likely to seek treatment, but they're more open to therapy compared to the atypical depressed men. Someone was talking about working with anger and how hard these men are to treat, right? I forget who, was, who talked about working a lot with the violence and anger with men. And these guys are very hard to treat and they're less open to therapy. Let me give a clinical vignette of a, a sensitive or feeling men. These men may present more with traditional depressive symptoms. They tend to be more non-traditional in their masculinity. They're more able to ask for help, seek treatment. They more are able to express vulnerable feelings. You know these guys? Can you relate to these sort of more sensitive men, uh, more feeling-oriented men? These men have problems. They suppress anger. While the angry guys act out their anger, these men tend to um, suppress their anger. They tend not to feel good enough. They tend to not be assertive. They, if we're Jungian, they're afraid of their shadow side. Uh, and these men have their narcissistic wounds are more available than treatment in the beginning. They tend to have low esteem, a lot of guilt. They're caretakers. And their attachment style are anxious attachment. You know these men? And they're often, they're fun patients. I mean, they want to lean. They're, they're wonderful to work with. They're, you know, they're, 
these are you know, good patients to work with in that sense. Let me give you a clinical vignette. This is a middle-aged guy. His birth name was Jose. He went by Joe. These are made-up names. He had struggled with anxiety and depression and had to drop out of college in his first year because of suicidal thoughts and feelings. His parents were raised in the tin can homes in Tijuana. You know, there were homes built out of tin cans. And they immigrated here and they became very, you know, very middle class and successful, hardworking. But the father had tremendous issues with rage. And uh, Joe told us, he was in my men's groups, about coming home with all A's and a B and his dad would whip him for the B. He said, they always taught me to make our family proud. Um, these men tend to split off their narcissistic wounds. They split off the rage and the anger they have towards their family, towards their parents, towards the dad. They're more doubtful about their success. Uh, here's how Joe said it. I never feel I'm good enough. I put on a happy face and tell everybody I'm okay. His current breakdown that brought him back into therapy, into the group at least, was that he went to help his dad who was having some slowing down cognition with aging. And his father in a rage threw him out of the house and says, I never fucking want to see you again. This triggered another series of depression and suicide. So as I said, these men, these feeling guys struggle with being good enough. They need to be more assertive. They need to re-own their healthy, aggressive side, their assertive side, not to feel so guilty and take better care of themselves. And I'll talk about his suicidal crisis as well later in the talk. These are these feeling guys. Can you relate to these men? Right. Now let me talk about the last type of men that I see a lot. These are analytical guys. They're very work-oriented. They don't tend to be highly traditional. It's not on their radar. They're moderates. They're intellectual-oriented thinkers. They're top-down guys versus being feeling guys. And they're not angry men. They tend to be very self-critical and perfectionistic. They take care of their families through work. And they split off their traumas of growing up. And they're vulnerable to severe depressions in middle age, especially if there's a biological vulnerability there. And their attachment style is anxious avoid. And let me give you a um, vignette. I'm going to call this man Vincent. He was hospitalized right from his office due to incredible work stress and work failure or perceived failure. And in his first sessions, he said this. I've never had to rely on anyone my whole life. I learned from a young age I had to take care of myself, and there was no emotional connection at home. I've spent my whole life taking care of my family, and I feel weak and ashamed that I need help. These men avoid therapy, not because of so much the shame, some of the stigma, but they're just not on their radar. And they cope so well and they've adapted so well to their lives in terms of work that they focus on and on with that and they just carry on. And what happens in middle age, especially as a vulnerability depression, they often have these breakdowns. Do you know these men? Have you seen these guys in your practice? You know what I'm talking about? You have a picture of these men? And because they've waited so long to go to treatment, their depressions are way, way worse or their anxiety is way worse because they've waited too long. The feeling-oriented guys tend to get help quicker. They don't have as much shame and stigma around therapy. A Vincent said, I'm broken. I'm letting my family down. I'm falling apart and I need to rebuild who I am. Let me give you his background in a very clinical uh, a vignette, a break, breakthrough session for him, a transformational session. He started talking about his family. His mom was highly uh, successful. She was a computer person, early, one of those early women pioneers in the computer world. Uh, the parents divorced pretty early. The dad was sort of a nice, quiet guy into sports. And he'd see his dad, but not a feeling-oriented man at all. And when his mom, her Achilles heel was drug abuse, and she was having another drug binge, and this, this patient, Vince, had told me, I'm going to his dad. And with all these feelings, imagine you're 12 years old, he's a really bright guy, 
His mom's a really good person, but had terrible drug abuse, very unpredictable. And all these feelings he's having, he's 12. And what does the dad say to him? What's his advice? He says two things, do well in school and take care of your sister. So what these men learn is to disregard all the feelings, all their experience relating to trauma, whatever the trauma is, whether it's trauma with a big T or just ongoing family issues. Separate all their feelings, they learn to work hard, and they learn to be providers and caretakers. Vincent said, you know, before my, this depression, I thought I had a perfect childhood. I mean, I knew there were things that happened to my, my mom, but it just didn't affect me. So they disregard their whole emotional experience. This session became a pivotal work in the transformation in terms of his saying, taking care of himself more versus caring for others, reintegrating his emotions in part of his life to move forward. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. Oh. Sure. I like this. What's the reference? This? Yeah. I made this up. Um, <laughs> the atypical men we're talking about, um, this is, I, I, this is how I, this is sort of the archetypal guys that I see. Um, I'm not sure that there isn't really no reference to it except for, I mean, I think these are, men get described in the literature, especially around attachment style. Uh, Sue Johnson in her book about attachment talks about the analytic men. Whoop. Ooh, where'd we go? Um, being anxious avoidant. You know, the guys who come in and they're not relating well, they're intellectual lies, and they're good guys, but they have no ability to have, express feelings or attach. They've just avoided it. So what these men do to deal with childhood, what do they do? They work hard, they get in sports or music or activities. And so on the surface, they look, they are very adaptive. It's better than having alcohol drug issues or being angry or getting in trouble. But again, they've not integrated the trauma. They've not integrated their emotional life at all. That relate to these guys? Yeah. Uh-oh. Okay, let's go forward. All right. So the attachment style of the first two? The, the, um, the angry men tend to be anxious, avoid, uh, anxious um, avoidant, just avoidant totally. You know, those are guys in the conduct, you know, those guys overlap with the conduct issues, so their attachment is really, really poor. And we'll talk about their identification with the aggressor in a little bit.